What do you want me to sit? Well, I reckon I'll sit here when you get up. Oh, I can probably sit here. I don't care. I'm going to be called anyway. When does it start? Now. Four or five minutes is a short time to talk about quick time. Uh, just sit down. It's okay. Don't no worry about it. It's a quick time. Um, Video, right. actually. Yeah. So one of the things I like about this conference is, uh, is, um, is the fact that it's international and I can practice all my, uh, some of my languages and I can invite each other friends and French friends and I think there is a decent amount of French people guys here in this room. Mm. And, uh, sorry? Uh, I thought somebody else was saying something. So, uh, the next, the next, um, uh, next speaker is, uh, Nicolas Nogev, known as Zeno, which is a sword version. And uh, he's basically a friend of a friend. Friend of my friend of our friends. This is my friend. So his friend. But our friends. Um, which is uh, Damien, um, which uh, uh, is with the bus of, uh, oh, there, uh, of another people in a room. And I asked that guy a couple of months ago, can you make it as a speaker? And you might see him as a speaker next year. He's an awesome guy, just he apparently had a very weird idea of going on holiday right now. <laughs> With his family. Yeah. I thought, what? Wow. <laughs> the same thing as my conference? I'm like, crazy or what? So yeah, I'm sorry. My wife is not into that conference, maybe. But you can always yeah. So, and then he told me, but it, it's always kind. And he told me, well, you know, I know that other French guy, and I told him, yeah, but the only difference is in English. <laughs> And I thought, no, this guy actually speaks a little bit of English. And I, I, I was like, yeah, right. Um, yeah, right. It was actually true. And so this is where I met Nico, and we started speaking, and uh, he knows uh, apparently a bunch of stuff about video, and he has uh, as well an amazing t shirt. Uh, so please welcome Zero on stage. Not come from nowhere. And that's the important part. 
I'm going to bounce off Mike's presentation, Ken's presentation as well, and a lot of other things you'll see. So, first thing first, how does media work? You have an eyeball that's plugged into your brain. It's a camera that has 74 megapixels, roughly. So, the red and stuff, awesome. But for most purposes, you don't need it. 74 megapixel is about most pixels can get in the eyeball. It's about ISO 800. So, don't worry about too bright or too not bright enough. And it has, that's the important part, 100 millisecond response time. Which means that after 15 frames per second, you stop seeing images and you start seeing movies. The guys who saw that first, it was in the middle age, and they had that thing that was called a chemoscope, which was the thing that would rotate with a small hole that would let you see only one image at a time, and you would have a bird flying in and out of the tree. That thing has been around for centuries and it has been turned into uh, something that was reusable only recently by the Lumiere brothers who patented the whole system by a film. Where the film does better than the rest is that, well, first of all, it works like a Kinemasco, but the main part is that it is potentially infinite in length. And that was the huge revolution because before that it had uh, some kind of sequence that was a few images long. And after their invention, you could have one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever hours. They close like 12 hours of movie. And I mean, 12 hours of movie for our brain, we're wired for that. We can watch things move all the time. But images, the technology behind it is actually pretty recent. And it works in a very simple way. You send one image, one image, one image, one image. It's very important to know that it hasn't changed one bit in the last hundred years. All right, when you move on a computer, the main difference is how you manage the images. The computer generates the images, and so you transfer the brain to the system from the rotor, who would, would be the most important part and the most intelligent part of the system to the computer, which has its own clock, but it will generate the images one at a time. And that the fact that these clocks can be different is the main problem. You have your movie frame rate, your screen refresh rate, your network bandwidth, your eye bandwidth, and all that has to make something that looks animated. Just for the movie, you know, fans and purists and stuff. What can we do with digital that we can't do with film? Or well, we can modify the images on the fly, which is most of what us programmers would like to do. We want to add information to the movie while it's playing, we want to change it. And we can adapt the framework. And that is the most important part when you do mobile programming, because your cell phone does not have the power of a computer. Which means that every now and then, your computer has to draw a frame and it should be invisible. We're going to go back on that uh, when we talk about the uh, AD Foundation stuff because this is where it's going to Alright, quick time. Quick time. How many of you here have ever programmed with quick time? That's about uh, 10 of you. Uh, QuickTime is very old. It came from OS 6 in 92, and it's still with us, actually. What you have to know about QuickTime is it's huge, and it won't go away. <laughs> 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 Alright, a little bit of history. So, December, I'm sorry, anyway, December, December 2nd, 91. And, I mean, I had a friend of mine working at Apple, in the QuickTime framework, once told me that the whole source code for QuickTime was actually bigger than the whole source code of OS 7. It is humongous, it is convoluted, and no one today understands how it works. So if you feel lost, it's okay. <laughs> it is straight C 
And if you want to understand how Quick Pen works, you have to have some understanding of how Mac Toolbox works because it works along the same principles with full page structures, a lot of functions, and pretty good documentation actually. Um, and QuickTime was the main reason for carbon existence because carbon provides everything that QuickTime latches on and uses to work. But it's the only framework that actually does 100% rely on carbon. As of today, um, with the QT kit and the AD foundation, QuickTime is kind of duplicated. You can still see it every now and then, and I'll show you now. All right, so the reason why we have a history at the beginning of the talk is because whatever you do with QuickTime, it still is based in analog world. Every time you deal with QuickTime, it's the same with core what we do actually, but every time you deal with QuickTime, you deal with metaphors of real objects. You have tracks. Tracks are actually things that went on the film. You had the audio track that was on the side of the, uh, the film, and it goes along using the motor clock that takes so long nicely. And when you think about how many people you have movies, you have to go back to what film must have been like. You have to, otherwise you won't be able to understand how it works. Unfortunately for us who like to tinker, which is myself, it's opaque okay structures only. You manipulate stuff that are pointers or can roll actually on something that you can't tinker with. But basically, when you deal with QuickTime, every piece of data is an atom. Every piece of treatment is a component and everything used to, to describe something in the structure. So if you read some sample code for QuickTime, you will always see component, 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 and data, which is atoms, and then you have all the, the, the huge structures to define what kind of data and data contains so that the component can read and display. The big thing in QuickTime that the clock at the very beginning was managed by developer, which meant that you could actually change the rate of the frame rate or, or the timing of every single event in the movie whenever you wanted it to. So here's a simple um, quick time data. As you can see, the move is a container that has metadata and some random information. And then you have the actual movie itself, which has a bunch of tracks and headers. If you think about it in analog, in an analog way, it's a continuous box. It's your, your team with all the tracks side by side, some information at the top, and then when you read them, you read them from left to right, and at the same uh, which is very critical for performance for purposes, which is the main problem of video computing today. All right, here's some gory details, some code. Here's how you play the movie back in game one. So basically, you have all your opaque structures, the movie, the CG, graph, PDR, like all your tracks and stuff. You define everything was to be defined without uh, me. Right? So you open the, who knows what an FS that is? Just curious. <laughs> Just as good as Alright, so you had to manipulate this data in a completely opaque fashion. It, it's like you have this huge pointer of movie which you apply things to, and you just hope it up. And then you would try to do stuff with the track, like enable it or not. So you would actually iterate on the movies to get the first track, the video type, that is enabled. And then you would have some kind of pointer to handle on something that you could actually do something to like. Uh, in that particular instance, I had to write something that would stream over a line, so I had to make sure that we get chunks, the amount of data, Past the one time would be uh, constant. That's the thing. And then you have this old thing that you can still see in some of your crash logs, even in any player, any information and stuff. This is a pre-roll problem. 
The pre-roll problem is, it's also an analog problem. It's when you get the file, the contents of it might be fragmented, might be organized in such a way that it might be difficult to read them fast enough for the playback to be fluid. And so you had to pre-pre-roll it, meaning you had to read the edit, basically. And then pre-roll the movie, which meant loading the table of all the samples, images, and sounds in memory, so that somewhere it would only have to make one lookup to know what to display at one particular point in time. And of course, there was no play, pause, or whatever, because it was way too advanced for that. We said the movie, right? Zero is pause, one is play, and this one is play. Finally, if you wanted to play a movie, you had to set up your own loop, main even loop, and say every now and again, in quick time, do something about your movies. Movies next. Do it. It's now. Do it. That's the clock system. Very important. The clock system was a way for the developer to tell the CPU you now have some time to deal with the video. Alright, a little bit of history about QuickEye, um, just for the sake of uh, you know, knowing what's going on. QuickTime 1.0 is basically the same as QuickTime 7. There's no change in architecture, no change in data types, no change in the way it works. It's just built on top of that. We have new formats, we have easier functions to use, but basically it still is the same as System 6. Then we had um, QuickTime 2.0 which actually added everything that came to life about QuickTime and that disappeared in the implementation, which is the, the interesting types of tracks like sprites and text. Uh, it went away, but it was the uh, first version of QuickTime that allowed the developer, a skilled developer, to treat any kind of animation as if it were a video, which changed radically the way people look at animation. And that was in 94. That was a long time ago. Quirtec 3 added something else that is now pretty common, but that is completely revolutionary. It's the, the possibility to read and write directly on a wire. You had a camera, you could directly display the, the, what the camera was seeing on your screen, and output it back to the camera or the screen or whatever in real time. And at the time it was System 7, we had, it was the beginning of an RPC. The machines were not that powerful, but on our Macs, we could do real, live, video editing. We could have someone speaking in front of the camera and have titles and sprites and, you know, things in the corner, news at the bottom. It was possible in 98 on a simple, 2CX, a little bit boosted. Um, then, well, then after that, it's just a matter of adding new formats. In Group N4, it's all the MP3 image conversion and stuff. And the fact that, hey, you know what? We might not be reading or writing that video directly from a disk. We can stream. First, a kind of painting system, which gave birth to pretty much everything we have today. Streaming a video is a hard problem. You have to chunk the data, make sure that the player always has enough things to do, but not too much because you don't want too much. And then, of course, the birth of AAC, which gave the music store, etc. And the current version is 7.7.4, and that's going to be the last one. There's not going to be any new development done in QuickTime. There will not be any QuickTime 8. It's QuickTime X, which is just for competitive purposes. Uh, anyone who's ever used the QTK at the time knows that um, it was really clever on playback. Nothing else. Even today, you have to do complex stuff on video. 
I still have to use quick buy. Proof. Alright, here's what that done a couple nights ago. So this is 10.8 for the one. For the others. List all the obligations. List all the frameworks to me through. It's not these quick times, is it? Oh we have and we have screw flow, which we're using right now. We have our books offer, which is less than a year old. My bad. And that would just be all the uh, I whatever CD. A movie and a photo. Even today, Apple cannot get rid of it. For some obvious reasons, it's been there forever. It works perfectly. And it's very simple once you get that all you're doing is managing a bunch of symbols, images of sound, presenting it to some kind of centralized system that will sync them, display them. And that's it. All right, just a side note on the QT kit. QT kit is the official Cocoa router around QuickTime. It works really well, but it does only high level manipulation. You can copy and paste tracks to the movies, but that's about it. If you want to modify an image in the movie, quickly. You can copy and paste track insertions and stuff, and of course, play that. But if you look at the QT kit, even today, in 10, 48, 49, 41, it gives you, if you ask for it, gives you the opaque structure for the QuickTime framework, shouldn't you to manipulate the actual data. They were trying to replace it with AD Foundation. And the AD Foundation, even for an old hack such as myself, who loves the time and passion, it is a very good start. It's something that you can see might be able to replace with time with it. So we're going to try to take a look where it's different and you know where it's going, and then what are the advantages of using any foundation of the good time, which is typically a because obviously there is no quick time on iOS. It's not there. Even if you want to, you can use it. So in iOS 4, so it took some time, Apple said, well, you want to do stuff with video on iDevices? Yeah, we can do that for you. We're going to open it up. It was in, it was obviously in iOS 1, but in the public API, you can ask for it. What does it do for you? It captures and plugs. That's about it. But you can see hints in what I'll show you later that it can probably do a little more if it's open to you. And what it does is it's basically a wrapper around some less known frameworks, which are core media, core video, and core image. Core image is probably the best known of the three. Core video is just about clock. Core video gives you a way to manage the clock and give you buffers, give you fill, or display on screen at specific times. That's all there is to it. And core media is not known at all. There is no, almost no documentation. If you want to play around with it, good luck. But for media is actually the way of Apple to hide all the data manipulation of QuickTime in some modern framework. Alright, here's how it works. So I don't know if you guys can see it. We have Core Media Core Audio Core Animation and everything else is built on top. Core Media deals with obviously media. This is where the encoders and the decoders reside. Then you have Core Video that will handle display and synchronization and core image that will apply filters or add new things on what will be presented. 
You can chain them yourself if you want to. Yeah. Bypass the foundation is actually not that hard. You set up a core video clock that taps into a bunch of buffers, and then every time core video acts to through the delegates or through the callbacks for a specific image for a specific time, just give it to them. And that main foundation is basically something that makes all that jazz easy. That's all there is to it. As I said in the title of the presentation, video is not that complicated. Execution is for a lot of reasons. But the concepts are simple, and whenever you have to deal with video, remember that the concepts are simple. It's A, B, C, that's A. One present frames, specific frame rate, same to a specific audio track, and display some text on it. When we do that, you have to understand that there's a clock, you latch on the clock, and you do things in such a way that it doesn't freeze the whole system just because it takes you one second to display the line of text, and it will fuck up the clock for everybody else. Simple, very simple mechanics. So here's core media. As you can see, it's not the clean structures, still it's not very beautiful. Here's how you present a sample to the game foundation. A sample of data in terms of video terms is an image. It's one second of sound or half second of sound on one channel. It's a piece of text. It's a sprite. It's whatever you want, but you have to make sure that this symbol is readable by the core video or whatever thing that you're trying to present it to. That means knowing timing, format, and how to display it. Basically, that's what core media is all about. If you want to write your own coder or decoder, you just write basically the Greek subclass of one of the uh, or media, well, that's a lot of it's not as fancy, but you write uh, some kind of a weird wrapper that will present itself as a class that gives samples to the system whenever it asks for Here's what core video does. Well, that, that's still core media. Core media gives you information about samples and stuff. Here's how core uh, AV player uses core media symbols. As you can see, even if you have a perfectly valid asset that you get on the internet, or an archive, or whatever, underneath it all, it still has core media. You can actually copy the buffers to use the yourself. My mind being generated. The sample codes with that stuff is pretty well hidden on the ideology side. But if you come and talk to me afterwards, I can point you to some interesting sample codes and stuff that will do that for you. Interestingly, um, the, the whole core media thing, the whole core video thing, is kind of like core audio, if you guys have heard of it. It's a very, very, very powerful thing that uses less than 20 functions. But each one of them has to be grabbed. Don't be afraid. The type checking is pretty good, especially in the next four point five, and it's going to work out just fine. Just remember, whenever you want to display something on the screen, in terms of screen, it still is a bunch of pixels. In terms of video, it's never just a bunch of pixels. It's timing. It's Geometry is attached to something synchronized or attached to something else. So the more information you have about the media, the more information you're about to provide about the media, the better the display system will work. If you guys have performance issues with a foundation, it's probably because your media is not clear enough, it's not presented in such a way that the, the playback system is able to optimize the synchronicity of it. So check it, check with a simple function like that, you can check 
how many times a second does AV Foundation grab a buffer from whatever I'm trying to apply? It? And you can debug it and see if that time to get that buffer is short enough or long enough. And finally, because you know, we have to show that sometimes the video is not that complicated. Here's my plan with AV Foundation. It's really simple. You create an asset, which is a source. You make an item out of it. The item is the way to encapsulate. It's like a free roll. It provides information to the player about the asset as to how it's going to play. Then you set up the player and then you play. Simple. What goes behind it is not much more complicated. It's longer, right? But it's really as easy as that. You present the medium, and that's it. All right. What is the advantage of AD Foundation over QuickTime? Apart from that, it's new. You have a lot of flexibility in the way you do things because you can have multiple movies playing side by side on top of each other. And you rely on the lowest possible levels of the system in order to play a video. If you play a video, it takes precedence over pretty much everything in the system. Which means that if you use a foundation, you're milking every ounce of power you get. As of today, playing a video on a computer is the single most important stuff in the system, as far as that all is concerned. Therefore, they work very hard to provide you with a framework that will give you enough horsepower to display a video, even on something that was unthinkable. Ten years ago, playing a video on a on, on phone, you will never have enough power to do that. You have to decompress stuff, you have to move it into RAM, you have to move it to the display 30 times a second. It is huge. And it works. In AD Foundation, the encoding side is right on the flimsy side. Yes, you can transcode whatever asset you want into an MP4. That works just like a child. You can probably do that in some lesser known formats, but if you want to translate it into MPEG 2 TS, for instance, no good. AV Foundation is a simplification of core media, core video, and core image, which means that if these three frameworks cannot handle whatever you're trying to do, AV Foundation won't be able to. Right? Remember that when you're trying to play a video and it was all stuttery and stuff, you messed up with the encoding. It's not the system that's broken. The, if you want to go deeper into how it works in the vineyards, Apple actually has provided with, it's pretty recent, I think it's just within length, but I'm not sure of it. There's the AVI Asset Reader Output and the AVI Asset AV Asset Writer Input, which lets you subclass them and provide AV player with your own images from your own format. It's pretty hairy though. It is something that you have to implement 27 different methods that are handling for media buffers. So it is pretty hairy, but it can be done, and especially when you're trying to debug like I, I encourage you when we have the videos very soon. I saw that. Yeah. To look at, uh, at Ken's presentation yesterday about debugging, because when you're doing video, you have to know that stuff in order to be able to do why the thing is not working the way it should be. Because you're dealing with stuff that is so low level that if you don't know the names of the functions and you use it, you're pretty much, it, it's hopeless. You have to know how it works. Then set up a new subclass of reader output or writer input, whatever, 
and try to figure out why the system is not decoding or encoding the frames it's not blocking. That's very good. Once we've done QuickTime and AD foundation, there's a, a few things that are go on top of it that are a lot easier to use. And um, I mean, we all have problems with um, MP media player, whatever, you wouldn't double up, whatever, you would send it, you know, or something like that. But in my mind, and I may be wrong with that, but in my mind, MP media player, the whole media player framework, is actually a simple, simple code from Apple telling you, hey, here's how you could do things for playing media. But in reality, you're supposed to use AD Foundation to do that. It's just, it makes some things easier. And they've thrown, they've thrown in that framework access to the iPod side of the iPhone, which is interesting, obviously, but it's kind of side of that. Alright, so, um, MG Media Player is just about data. Simplifies playback, simplifies all the interface, you can play, pause, time, make it small, big, and that's it. It gives you access to the iPad side of your iPhone or your iPad, and it works like this. Basically, you just tell the media player, load that URL, and play it. And as one of the very famous cats in the nineties was, there's no such thing. It's, it's just all you can do with knowledge shit. If you want to pick music from your iPhone library, it's about as easy as that. You set up a delegate, you say open the media picker, and then tell me what you want to do with it. And then here in that particular instance, I use the iPod player to play music in the background, so it's not my application, it's the music. It's the actual iPod player, and uh, that way I can continue doing my stuff while the music is playing. It's useful for sign up a lot of blocks. You delegate the whole, the whole sound playing to the system. Is there anything you cannot almost remember? Okay, so um, I just wanted to throw a tiny bit of information about core animation because then the UX love it for a very good reason. <laughs> but for any intended purposes, if you like core animation, you're already doing most of what video players are doing. They define starting point and ending point at a time. The only difference between an animation with core animation and video is that the CPU renders the intermediate frames. That's the only difference there is. The whole clock system dropping frames because you don't have enough power to do it, everything else works exactly the same way. So, one last thing that we can see that I lost some of you. Missed. Uh, the last part of the talk is just Alright, just a, couple, a few things to remember. If you go 20 frames per second, it gives you 50 milliseconds to do something. That's the performance issue right here, right there. On a 2GHz 2 2 CPU, it's 100,000 cycles. It's very short to do everything. So if you're in the process of writing a player and you do something along the movie playing experience, remember, if the stuff that you're doing is taking more than 100,000 CPUs per second, A is wrong and the video is going to do a stuttery and it won't work. Under 20 frames per second, it stops being a video and it starts being like a an 80s Japanese anime. 
at six at seven hundred and twenty p one frame is three point five megabytes. That's a huge amount of data to go from the disk to the RAM, from the RAM to the VRAM. Keep that in mind. When you're doing video, there's just a lot of transfer going on. So the more you bubble up the memory, the more transfers you have, the more choppy it is. 80, 80 player, quick time player, even into play and G media player are optimized for all this stuff for you. If you don't have any clue as to what you're expecting from player and you think it's too choppy or whatever, it comes from the media. Don't, don't accuse Apple of having a crappy framework because from what I can see, they're doing a very good job at having the most powerful thing possible. Now, it's not always good, which is why you have ways to give it hints, provide it with data in a way that you prefer. But by default, AV player goes as fast as possible. If it's not as fast as you like it to, there's probably something wrong with the rest of it. By default, then again, as every piece of software on the planet is often perfect, and there are probably some bugs. But for MP4 playback, MP3 playback, whatever, if you have a problem with that, it comes from media or from whatever thread thingy you're trying to do on the side. When you do video on an iPad and iPhone, it's a little specific, but the data throughput of the, the flash drive is actually not a bit. It's kept. You have roughly, as you know, rough estimate, you have the same speed reading video from your drive as you have reading video over Wi Fi and a distant disk. Think about it. Maybe the processor can handle 1080p, maybe, but reading it is going to, and that's why you have like all this buffering thing at the very beginning, because the transfer rates are not that good. If you expect instant playback, it won't work. Preloaded, presented. Remember also in terms of performance that for every frame you see on the screen, there's at least memory copy from the RAM to the VRAM. That's the minimum. And then you might have a copy of it, encoding and end process. So, again, 50 milliseconds for all of that. Double recharge. And that brings us to um, the, the, the most powerful thing that was invented for video in the last century differential encoding. Before that, every frame, just like a film, was its own. With MPEG, among others, it's differential. It minimizes the amount of data you have transferred and minimizes the now decoding, because all it does is you take that piece of the frame, this, this is all the only thing that changed, so I only need to give you that. And that speeds things up a lot, which is why we have MPEG today as a default format and not DV, which is full frame. So, about MPEG, just again, it's a mist. Thoughts about it. Worst case scenario, every single frame is different. And that's when you have like a traveling thing and you see all your images will be choppy as hell. It's because every frame is different from the previous one, sufficiently different that you have to re encode the whole frame. And that's where the gobs come in. In your encoder settings, you have that in the gob. The gob is the gob is a group of picture that are originally in. Basically, it tells the, the encoder, the encoder, you have one full frame, then X differential frames. The longer the gob, the smaller the size of the end movie. 
But the riskier you have artifacts, the riskier it is you have an artifacts on the screen because it's just too big to be one differential here. By the way, differential frames you have I, B, D, so that's uh, the first one is I, it's complete, and you have all delta ones B, D. But remember, when you do encoding, GOPS should be around 13 frames, which is about half a second, and that's usually enough. If you want a shorter file, a smaller file, increase the GOPS size. But the quality will go down as well. It's all a matter of what you want out of it. If you want performance, longer GOPS. If you want quality, shorter GOPS. Also, when you're encoding a movie, mind the let. This is out of like 90s. It's 90s. Think about colors in terms not of like that. The whole 32 bits I can handle, but one part of the encoding process is reducing the plus size. So you have to think that if your movie is all green, it's going to be smaller than if it's green on the side on one side and red on the other side. And so that's one of the most common mistakes that people who include stuff that leave like a line of white on the bottom or at the top or on the sides. And that can that can add 20% of the size of the movie itself because the palette size is a lot bigger. So remember, try not to be too moving around and have color that are in the same space. Um, and obviously, if you have a encoding, you should know that two pass, especially for high devices, two pass encoding is way better. It takes four times the amount of time, but you end up with something that will be better, look better, and has less performance issues. Alright. In terms of playback, what matters is Difference in pixels. But the problem is you are trying to synchronize two different clocks the clock on screen and the clock of the decoder. You may have a movie that goes at 75 five frames per second. If your screen goes only up to 20, what's the point? You're decoding three frames and displaying only one. Try to adapt the kind of media you're playing on the devices to the clock on the screen or a multiple clock on the screen. Basically, 25, 30 is good. Higher, useless. When you're dealing with video, assume non thread state. It's not because there are a bunch of threads in the background that do whatever they want, that you can do the same. If you go, you manipulate buffers in a different thread than the main thread, there's a good chance that you're going to crash your application. It is supposed to be thread safe, but it's not. 80% of your bugs is memory related. You're passing the buffer to the player, and then before it can play it, you release it. Or it gives you a buffer, you're trying to manipulate it, but by the time you're done doing that, it's displayed an image and it's gone. And you're trying to tap into a buffer that does not exist anymore. So, I mean, I know it's kind of ugly, but model size is a friend. Whenever you receive a, an image buffer that you want to manipulate in the video context, check that it has a size because it means it's still valid. Uh, the rest of the problems is about refresh and loss. You try to put an image when the system was not ready for it, or you lock the system because it's waiting for something from you that you haven't given it. And that's all there is to it. This covers 99% of all your bugs. Memory trouble, thread state. If for all intents and purposes you have 10 milliseconds to do something. 
So if you're planning on changing all the colors, it's fine. If you're planning on discovering if there is the red that somebody you know in the brain, you do it in a different thread, you put it somewhere else. But you don't expect for video to allow you to do that. They don't have time, you don't have time. If you want to modify a video, prepare off screen. If you want to put some subtext on something, a logo, whatever, you prepare the image off screen and split it every single time. Don't create it on the fly. And if all possible, try to respect screen sizes and ratios because when you encode a movie on a different ratio of the screens that it's intended for, the CPU has to work a lot. You smooth the pixels and you shift it so that it looks kind of good on your devices. So if you plan on releasing some video for an iPhone, make it iPhone size. iPad's a different kind of movie. And that's it for the video system. I don't know about you, but I love a bunch, bunch of stuff. Um, Alright, so we're doing a, a small break, uh, as small as the last one, because I don't think the food will probably really do it, because we would be too early for the food, but then we would make it for the food. So let's be nice to food. Now I'm going to grab some drink and come back in a few minutes.